It's not enough that every woman in the world finds him attractive. Now he has to woo the inanimate ones? Just leave some for the rest of us, man. When you first read the premise of Lars and the Real Girl, you might write it off as a creepy movie of a guy who falls for an inanimate object, or a quirky romantic comedy Weekend at Bernie's style. But this film is so much more, as it discusses openly and sincerely mental illness. It digs deep into important messages such as compassion and acceptance, a town coming together for one of their own, and the transitions into becoming a man and building relationships. That's what makes this film such a wonderful piece of media and leaves me very excited to analyze it. As always, I'll be discussing crucial plot points throughout my diagnosis, so if you haven't seen it yet, go rent it on Netflix, pop a squat, watch it, and come back. All good? Okay, let's go. The protagonist of the film is Lars, played wonderfully by Ryan Gosling. He exhibits asocial traits, gets very anxious when around others, and displays no interest in romantic relationships, or really any relationships for that matter. Hello, Lars. That is until his soulmate gets shipped right to his door. Now the great thing about this movie from a clinical perspective is that we get to piece together the character's history, witness his behaviors in therapy, and observe his transitions after treatment. Based on the film's account, Lars has lived in the same fictional small town his whole life. His mother passed away during childbirth, so he grew up with his father and his older brother Gus. Because of his wife's death, Lars' father slipped into a depressive state and was reported as never wanting anyone around. As soon as Gus was old enough, he left home, leaving Lars at the mercy of his father's depression. Now having a depressed parent is one of the most dysfunctional things for a child to grow up with, since children require socialization and high energy activities for their own development. But when they refuse these interactions, they become socially isolated, anxious, and can sometimes become depressed themselves. Generally, childhood friends can help lubricate those social gears, but Lars never really mentions friends and tends to associate his success growing up to the accomplishments of his brother. Gus and I are both very lucky with women. She's wonderful. So let's talk about his presenting symptoms. When in uncomfortable and anxious situations, he tends to blink a lot. In psychology, we call this a tick disorder, specifically a simple motor tick. This includes behaviors such as licking one's lips, shrugging shoulders, or blinking excessively. The blinking is best seen when Lars is in social situations, so to emphasize its prevalence, I've spliced together two different scenes, one when Lars is with Bianca and one without. Another behavior that Lars displays is an avoidance to touch. According to him, whenever anyone touches him, he feels a painful burning sensation at the point of contact. So you don't let people touch you. Lars, isn't that hard to get away with? No, well, not really here, because I have all these layers. And that helps. This is called a conversion disorder, a condition in which you show psychological stress in physical ways. As touch is important in conveying closeness or intimacy, this could be the brain's way of reacting to a perceived threat, such as when Lars assumes no one cares about him and people will just end up abandoning him. Oh, wait, she didn't abandon you. She'll be back. How do I know that? Huh? People do whatever they want. They don't care. But one of Lars' most predominant symptoms is his detachment and social isolation. He prefers to be alone rather than take part in group activities. And this is evident up until the third act when he begins to initiate relationships with others. Now there are three diagnoses that can account for social isolation and anxiety around others. Schizoid personality disorder, avoidant personality disorder, and social anxiety disorder. But the main reason that schizoid fits best is that number two and three center around the concept of fear. Fear that others will judge you. Fear that you will make a fool out of yourself or that you're undeserving of attention or love. 
Lars exhibits fear in the film, but it's in response to appropriate scenarios, such as when he's afraid of Karen dying during childbirth, or when he finds Bianca unconscious and she's rushed to the hospital. Never do we see Lars worry about other people's opinion of him. Instead, he seems less fearful and more so uncomfortable when around others, since he has adopted solitude as an important personality trait. This distinguishing characteristic is crucial in making the diagnosis for schizoid personality disorder. And finally, we get to delusions. Now if you remember in my video on Annie Wilkes, we discussed the different types of delusional disorders. Well, Lars doesn't necessarily fit any of these paradigms, so instead he is diagnosed with unspecified type. Now it is important not to make a diagnosis for fetishistic or any other paraphilic disorder, because the character of Lars is not sexually involved with Bianca nor does he ever hint to any sexual interest. Instead, his interests lie on having a caring and dependable relationship. But more importantly, his subconscious is interested in developing that relationship with another living person, and Bianca is his key in transitioning to that place. Let me explain. Throughout the film, we see Lars in almost every scene with this blanket wrapped around him. We later learn that his mother made it for him just before she passed away. The way that he treasures it is similar to a child with their favorite toy, never leaving it from their sight. I remember when I got my favorite toy growing up, and when my friend got his. So it is, in all intents and purposes, a safety blanket that represents his childhood. But when Bianca arrives, she is to Lars a symbol for adulthood and growing up. In the movie, we see Lars attempting to prove to Bianca that he's ready for manhood, but in reality, he's attempting to prove it to himself. You should watch me chop wood, too. I'm really good at it. And when Bianca rejects his marriage proposal, it's actually Lars telling himself he's not ready for the responsibility or even worthy of it. Lars also talks to his brother about what it means to be a man, since he is desperately trying to make the transition. Well, it's not like you're all one thing or the other, okay? There's still a kid inside, but you, you, you grow up when you decide to do right, okay? And not what's right for you, what's right for everybody, even when it hurts. Bianca is what he needs to break free of his social isolation and step out into an uncertain world. As Bianca comes into the picture, we start to see less of the blanket, and as the film goes on, we see Lars display a greater desire to interact with others. Towards the end of the movie, Lars is putting himself out there in social situations, finally able to touch another person without that searing pain that follows, and even contemplates a romantic relationship. So altogether, this explains his excessive blinking, his tactile sensitivity, asocial behavior, and delusions. That's why I've decided that Lars meets the diagnostic criteria for provisional tic disorder, conversion disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and delusional disorder. This has got to be one of my favorite roles by Ryan Gosling, as he portrays Lars' development in a realistic and respectful manner. But truly, the unsung heroes are Gus and Karen, all the town citizens, and Dr. Dagmar, played fantastically by Patricia Clarkson. Psychologists are too often portrayed in the media as manipulative, all-knowing, or blubbering idiots, and it is so refreshing to see an honest adaptation of a mental health worker who truly cares about the well-being of their patient. Lars and the Real Girl is a fantastic film on growing up, acceptance, and unconditional love and I feel very honored to have analyzed it for you guys. For this video, I thought I'd offer some resources on personality disorders. Personality disorders are very difficult to diagnose, since the symptoms tend to be ingrained in who the individual is, and people with the disorder tend not to seek treatment. It is most often through the help of family members or secondary symptoms like anxiety or depression presenting themselves that personality disorders are even uncovered. I've included some info on topics and hotlines to call if you require help for you or someone close to you that may have a personality disorder. Thank you for watching. I've been getting a lot of recommendations for movie characters to diagnose next, and I'm very excited to tackle those. If you haven't seen it yet, check out my diagnosis on Annie Wilkes from Misery, or Martin Riggs from the Lethal Weapon series. Be sure to click that like button and subscribe, and I'll see you next time on Real Disorders. Yeah.